Good morning. Welcome to Jersey Shore Baptist Church. Let's all stand. We're going to sing a hymn. 495, brethren, we have met to worship. Let's sing it out. Brethren, we have met to worship. kids choir comes on up and I think they're going to give us a, a little uh, treat this morning.
with a word of prayer. Father, we come before you today, Lord. We love you. We just thank you for the privilege and opportunity it is to be in your house. Uh, Lord, we thank you for the songs that were just sung. Uh, Lord, we thank you that we are saved by grace, Lord, by your blood. And uh, we thank you uh, for the truths that even uh, little children know. And uh, we thank you for the, the faith of a child uh, that can come to know you as Savior. Uh, Lord, we just thank you for uh, saving us who are saved, Lord. We pray that if there's anybody here who doesn't know for sure uh, that you are their Savior, that they would come to know you today, Lord. And uh, we just pray that we'll enter into your gates with thanksgiving and into your courts with praise. And uh, help us to be thankful today. And uh, bless your name, Lord. We love you. We thank you for our church. We thank you for all that you've done for us. We pray and ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good stuff. Let's sing another song. 185, Rock of Ages. Rock of Ages, glad for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy raven side which flow be of sin the double cure save me from its guilt and power not the labors of thy hands can fulfill thy laws commands could my zeal no rest I know could my tears forever While I draw this fleeting breath, when my eyes shall close in death, when I soar to worlds unknown, see thee on thy judgment throne, rock of ages left for me, let me hide myself in thee. Amen. Good singing. All right, praise the Lord. We're glad you're here. It's good to be in church. It's always good to be in church. It's especially good to be in church on Sunday morning. And, um, and so uh, I'm excited about today's service. Uh, we already had one service at 830. We're going to do it again. And, um, and so we're excited about tonight's service as well. We want to welcome you that are joining via technology. And um, I'm thankful for the people that uh, watch through Facebook and through the church website and all those things. I don't quite know all who's on here unless you leave a, a comment on Facebook. Then I kind of know if you're there. Um, but uh, it's like, for instance, my wife was watching on Facebook this morning at the 830 service, but it didn't show up on my phone that she was watching. And I recognized all these people. I said, well, thank Brother Charlie for being here and thanks this one for being here. And my wife texted me. She said, what am I, chopped chicken liver? And I said, well, you didn't show up on my feed that you were watching. So I don't know exactly how all that works, but uh, sometimes it shows up, sometimes it doesn't. But anyway, we're glad you're here. Paul Dees from down in Texas. Uh, he's a pastor down in Texas. He's watching. Uh, he's going through the whole Texas saga. They had the you know, sub-freezing temperatures, and, and I think either at his church or at his house, they've got burst pipes. And a lot of people at Phil's church have burst pipes. And um, so they're, they're doing their best to get their lives put back together down there. Uh, thank the Lord it warmed up a little bit. I think it's going to be in the 60s this week. So they will be back to sitting on the golf course during our noon Zoom prayer meeting, you know, kind of making fun of us while we're still freezing. Brother Joe Lingelbach out, we were outside the uh, Wimberg building, and, and uh, he was saying, boy, it's springtime out here. And uh, that's wishful thinking. It's not quite springtime, but it's getting there. It's getting a little bit warmer. That breeze has got to go away. If it was just the sunshine, it would be fine. Uh, anyway, I want to make mention of a couple things. Uh, we had our book club meeting on Friday night, and uh, we had a, quite a few people that came, not as many as the first book club meeting, and we had some people that joined us on Zoom as well. 
Um, but if you're interested in that book, we're reading a book called Safely Home by Randy Alcorn. And, um, you know, with every book that we read, they're not necessarily going to agree with us, and we're not going to agree with them in every area. But this is a great book. It's actually a, a fiction book, but I think you could probably call it and historical fiction, not that it really deals with a, a subject in history, but it's got a lot of accurate information in it about the underground church in China. And so uh, the underground church in China, you know, they, China has uh, registered churches and they have, they have authorized Bibles that have the government seal on them. And if you don't have a Bible with a government seal, they will take it, they'll confiscate it from you. And if you don't go to a registered church, you know, if your church is not registered, and the registered churches are, are, are not allowed to preach certain topics, uh, the second coming of Christ, anything that's against government, they would not allow that to be preached. And so as much as I think China tries to present itself as this bastion of new freedom, um, kind of a com combination of socialism, but enlightenment with capitalism and, and, and liberty, there's not a whole lot of liberty that goes on there, and there's a lot of persecution that goes on there. Now, you're not going to see it uh, on the news, but, it, but it's happening nonetheless. And uh, they estimate that the underground church in China is larger than the churches in America and in Europe combined, that there's you know, hundreds of millions of Christians uh, in China, but they're underground. And so it's a fascinating book. Uh, talking about the persecution and how many of these uh, church leaders go to prison and they're beaten and all this kind of stuff. And so if you're interested in the book, let me know. I had one book left over here, uh, but Miss Laurel wanted it, and so she took it. And so, but if you want, if you're interested in being part of that book club, um, you know, just let me know or you can register online on the website and we'll get you a copy of the book. It'll take just a couple of days for you to get it. Uh, but Amanda and I were just talking about all the stuff going on behind the scenes in government, and uh, that's been happening in other places in the world forever. And so these Christians, we can learn from these Christians as they're dealing, uh, from what they're dealing with, it may happen to us someday. And also, um, Justin, where are you at? He's not here, but Sammy's here. Um, uh, they had a youth activity yesterday, Justin and Sammy and Larry uh, were part of it. Some of our singles, uh, you know, joined up with that as well. Um, and they had a lot of fun. They did this crazy activity where they went to a thrift store and uh, each of the participants had to buy an outfit, a crazy outfit for somebody else. And they had to, the limit was $10, correct? So you had a $10 limit, you had to buy a crazy outfit. And, and you know how these guys are. They, they were not trying to be nice in picking out something that was going to really be flattering and look good on the other person. They were trying to pick the zaniest, craziest outfits that they could. And then with their new outfits on, they had to go and roller skate. Now, were they allowed to tell people what was going on? Nobody asked? Nobody asked? <laughs> See, in the world we're living in, everybody's crazy, so nobody really even blinks, just like whatever. Uh, but they, they had to roller skate, and, uh, but I understand they had a great time. And besides Weston bumping his nose, I think everybody was safe. And I pray about people being, especially roller skating. Uh, you know, we, we've had uh, a few accidents, not here. Well, Brother Bob, we shared this morning that Brother Bob got, um, he, he broke his ankle and had to get surgery going down the slide at Camp Calvary. And now they have a sign there that says, this is for children, not adults. But somehow his leg got caught in that slide. That slide kind of whips around, but his leg was a little bit longer than the whip in that, in that slide, and he broke his ankle going down, and he had to get surgery. But I think that's been the only major accident. We've had a couple, huh? Did he? I don't remember that. Roller skating? I didn't remember that. Uh, Al, Al Spina's wife, Erica, in, at the Christian Bible Church, she broke her arm and had to get surgery roller skating. So when, when they say they want to go roller skating, I mean, all kinds of flags go up here. And I'm like, oh, man, I'm begging God to keep those kids safe. Because you parents, you're all about them having fun and going roller skating. But as soon as your kid gets hurt, <laughs> buddy, the, the fangs and the, and the horns come out. And it's like, well, how couldn't you? How could you allow this to happen to my child? And so... I don't know if you know you parents are like this, but you are. Anyway, if you're visiting with us, I don't know if there's anybody visiting with us. Anybody first-time visitor here? I don't see anybody visiting with us for the first time. Who? Joe? Joe's not a first-time visitor. Joe's been here forever. 
He got a second shot, though, so he is in the building. So, amen. He's still got his mask on, though. Um, but um, if you're visiting with us online, you want information about the church, there's a button on the website. It says, My Response. Give us whatever information you want. The only thing you got to give us is your email address, and we'll let you know what's going on here at the church. If there's changes in the schedule or any kind of activity going on that we want to let you know. We won't blow up your inbox, promise. But we'll let you know if there's stuff going on. All right, we're going to sing a song, Great is the Lord. You don't need your hymn book for this, but they'll put it up on the screen. You need your Bible, actually. Scripture song. Great is the Lord. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, in the mountain of His holiness, beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole world. His Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of our Let's all stand for the scripture reading as Brother Paul comes. Sure. Second Peter verses 12 through 15. I'll read 12 through 14. We'll all join together on verse 15. Second Peter verse 12. And the Bible says, Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them and be established in the present truth. Yea, I think it meet, as long as I am in this tabernacle, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance, knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ has showed me. All together on verse 15, Moreover, I will endeavor that ye may be able, after my decease, to have these things always in remembrance. All right. Praise the Lord. Let's sing another song, Ancient of days. Think about it as we sing it. Don't get caught just uh, singing songs. Let's praise the Lord. For the nations rage, kingdoms rise and fall. There is still one king reigning over all. So I will Thread. 
singing. Um, you may be seated, and uh, I'm just going to go through a few announcements real quick. And uh, first announcement is that there's going to be a special prayer meeting February 26th um, from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Come when you can and leave when you can or when you have to. Child care will be provided. See Brother Bob Fenton for more um, information on that. That's February 26th. Um, and then we have the Scripture Assembly Project, which is March 6th. Uh, join us uh, for this year's Scripture Assembly Project with uh, North, Northeast Bible Seed Line. We will be meeting at the church at 8 a.m. for breakfast, and we'll have a challenge from the Word of God given by Brother Scott Sandy. And uh, so be there uh, March 6th, and once again, it's going to be at 8 a.m. in the morning. We have a soul-winning blitz that we're going to be doing March 13th. Join us. Um, it's time for us to get back to the highways, hedges, streets, and lanes to reach our town for Christ. We will be meeting at the church at 10.30 a.m., and once again, that's March 13th. If you have any questions or anything about that, um, you can see Pastor Erickson. We have a couples retreat um, April 15th through the 17th, and um, I think there's a sign-up sheet or something over there. I saw information over there about it. But you can register on the website, um, and so that would be a, a help if you registered on the website. We have the Homeless Ministry, Hope Through Grace. Um, and uh, there's tons of stuff that you can donate to that. You can see Ms. Ms. Darla Griffin or Mrs. Becker for more information on that or how to give or anything like that. So um, those are the announcements, and uh, we're just going to thank the Lord. We're going to spend some time in prayer, thank the Lord um, for providing for our needs and uh, just blessing us and, and the fact that we get to have church, and uh, Lord, the Lord is just good. So let's just spend a moment in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much. Um, for providing for our needs and blessing each and every one of us. We thank you, Lord, for providing for each individual here, but we also thank you, Lord, for providing for the church as a whole. We thank you, Lord, for the faithfulness of your people and, uh, Lord, just giving to you and giving to your cause. And, God, we just pray that you'd have your hand over um, the rest of the service and help us, Lord. I pray that you'd be with Pastor as he preaches. I pray you'd fill him with the Holy Spirit, speak to our hearts. And, uh, Lord, we just love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. slavery to sin, intend to live apart from God, unaware of grace, unaware of truth, confined to labor on this side, but a miracle occurred, the Son of God became Stained his cross, bought us peace with God, and 
been nailed to the cross of my Savior, where Satan has no power, for God has displayed his undeserved favor. He's taken my sin and he has nailed it to the cross. In Second Peter chapter 1. Junior church, you're dismissed. They were already dismissing. Second Peter chapter 1. We've been in Second Peter chapter 1 for quite a while, but we're actually kind of moving forward now. Um, we were kind of Stuck in those verses, verses 5 through 7, where Peter gives us seven things that we need to diligently add to our faith. And um, we took eight weeks, a week for an overview, and then seven weeks to go over each one of those um, character traits or attributes, godly attributes that God wants us to fully develop uh, within our faith. And um, But now we're moving on. We're going to move past that, but even in moving on, we're going to be reminded about those seven things again. And um, for most of you are well aware of this, but just a reminder for those of you who may have just be looking at this for the first time, uh, Peter is writing this letter and the letter before it, First Peter as well, at uh, the second half of the first century AD, and it's during a time of great persecution, the church, the churches of Christ were... Uh, being persecuted severely for their faith. And if you were a Christian that lived back in that time, it was a very strong likelihood that you were going to die for your faith. And Peter is encouraging them to remain faithful. See, we live in a place, and even though the persecution is heating up a little bit, and even though um, we see the stage kind of being set for the, you know, the ultimate end time scenario, um, 
we, we live in a place where we still have a lot of freedom. We can't even fathom some of the difficulties that these people faced in this, in this time. Now, we know that, and we're learning through our, our book club, that there are Christians that are facing this kind of persecution throughout the world. Um, but these Christians were really going through a lot of suffering. So Peter writes a lot about suffering. He writes a lot about enduring and remaining faithful. And that's kind of the overall theme of uh, 1 Peter and 2 Peter. And then 2 Peter, he, he also emphasizes very heavily, uh, he emphasized it a little bit in the first letter, but he emphasizes very heavily the second coming of the Lord. The Lord's coming back. And even though you may be going through a difficult time, you may be going through persecution, you may be struggling as a Christian, stay faithful, uh, keep enduring because Christ is coming back soon. And so, and by the way, if, if uh, we have to endure a little longer than we had hoped, His grace is always going to be sufficient for us. And so that's the kind of like overriding theme of the letter. Now, as we conclude this first chapter of, first, of 2 Peter, Peter's really taking a trip down memory lane, and that's just really a phrase, a catchphrase, um, because he, he uses the word remembrance three times in, this, in these first four verses, and he wants to remind us of things, things that he already told us, but things that he wants us to be reminded of. And did you ever notice that the older we get, and Peter is writing here at the end of his life, and he knows that the Lord's going to bring him home soon, and it's believed traditionally, historically, that Peter died about maybe a year or two after this letter was written, maybe even um, less than that. Um, but he knew he was going to die. He knew the Lord was going to take him home to heaven. And did you ever notice that older people, when they're getting ready or preparing for death, they, they spend a little bit more time reminding the people they love about things that they think are important. And... Um, Peter wanted to remind these struggling first century believers about some things that they needed to remember. And we need to be reminded often of a lot of things, but primarily here in this context, biblical truth. We tend to easily forget what God has told us in the past. I shared with the, the congregation earlier at 830, um, you know, much of what I'm telling you, if you've been saved for any length of time, isn't anything new. You've heard it all before but it's a reminder. And so we need to be reminded often. That's why we shouldn't just read the Bible one time and then put it back on the shelf and say, we read it. By the way, did you ever notice books that we're interested in and books that mean a lot to us, whether they're the Bible or not, and the Bible is not a book, it's, it's well beyond a book, um, but, but we reread them often. We wanna be reminded of some of the truths that are contained in those books. But that's why we should read the Bible often. And we should be constantly immersing ourselves in the Word of God, even though we've read those portions of Scripture many times before. There's always a new truth that we may have missed, or maybe there's a new truth that we read it many times before, but we didn't need it then, but we need it now. And uh, there are certainly old truths that we need to be reminded of often. And so the word remember is found in the Bible 148 times, and then the word remembrance is found 48 times, so almost 200 times, 196 times, you see remember or remembrance in the scriptures uh, from the Old Testament to the New, but we see it three times in four verses uh, here in our text, and uh, you know, God teaches us things, but He expects us to remember what He taught us. And we need to be reminded continuously if we're going to remember what God wants us to remember because we tend to forget. Let me give you a couple other verses. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 5. The Bible says, remember ye not, Paul writing to the church at Thessalonica. He was just there. He said, when I was yet with you. He had been there just a few months prior to him writing this letter. And he said, I told you these things. So what is Paul saying? Look, I told you these already but I want to remind you of them. I want you to remember them. Jude said this. He said, I will therefore you put in remembrance, though you once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. He said, you know that, but let me remind you of that truth. And so there are a lot of things that God wants to remind us about. And by the way, we're, we're big about reminders, aren't we? I mean, we set reminders on our phone 
you know, I'm constantly trying to remind myself I forget things. And sometimes in the ministry, if you forget something, people get, men get really offended. I remember one time, um, Brother Don asked me to do a Rotary Club meeting. I was supposed to speak at a Rotary Club meeting. And, um, and Brother Don's the type of guy that he just gives you it two months in advance, and he expects you to remember it. Now, here's a little something for the rest of you. If you want me to ever do something like that, you need to remind me uh, every day prior to that, and then even 10 minutes before that, uh, remember, I'm just reminding you, you have to be there. And so I forgot all about it. I didn't show up. He didn't call me. He didn't say anything. But like the week after on Sunday, he said, what happened? And I'm, I was clueless. What do you mean, what happened? What, you, we, didn't we have an appointment? You were supposed to meet at this. We were supposed to speak at our Rotary Club. And I said, ah, and then it dawned on me. I forgot all about it. But what do we need to do so we don't do that? We need to remind each other. We need to set reminders. My wife puts up little pieces of paper all over the place. And on Monday morning, Justin will tell you, you go out of the house and there's a piece of paper stuck to the door that says trash. Um, you know, she sets reminders. She's big about writing little pieces of paper and putting notes everywhere. Her mom did that. And, um, and so she kind of picked that habit up for her mom. But, uh, but we need to set reminders. And remembering things is, it can be a great source of encouragement. Uh, we remember good things. Of course, the memory of some bad things that we want to forget can be discouraging. But we're not really talking about those kind of memories. We're talking about things that we intentionally want to remind ourselves of or we intentionally want to allow God to remind us of. And it's a process that we need to go through, and we must choose to remember, we must choose to be reminded of things that are going to be helpful to us. And that's what God is saying here. So in these first uh, four verses, verses 12 through 15, we see Peter's final reminders to Christ's church. Now, I believe, I, I, I put the word final because, you know, it's kind of he's at the end of the game, and he's saying, okay, I know I'm going to die soon, so here's some things I want you to be reminded of. And let's read those verses again. We already read them once, but let's read them again. Wherefore, I will not be negligent. Now, notice that. I'll not be negligent. This kind of reminds me of verse 5 where he said, giving all diligence. Uh, diligence is the opposite of negligence. Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them and be established in the present truth. Yeah, I think it meet, that word meet means appropriate, suitable, uh, right. I think it right, I think it appropriate, I think it's suitable. As long as I am in this tabernacle, and he's talking about his body, his earthly tabernacle, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance, knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ hath showed me. Moreover, I will endeavor that you may be able after my decease to have these things always in remembrance. So the two things that jump right out at me is the word remembrance. And when you're studying the Bible, one of the things you want to do is look for repeated words. And uh, remembrance is a word that repeats itself three times in four verses. And anytime you see three, the same three words like that in a passage of Scripture, it's emphasizing something. And so this theme of remembering or reminding is, is heavy in this first section of our text. And the other thing is, is Peter three times alludes to the fact that he's near the time of his death. That word tabernacle is used referring to his body. But you see in verse 13, he says, as long as I am in this tabernacle. And so, you know, what is he saying? He's saying, well, I may not be in this tabernacle for very long. And then in verse 14, I must put off this tabernacle shortly. It means I only got a little bit of time left and this earthly body is going to go into the ground and, and my spirit is going to go up into heaven. Now, of course, the Catholics will tell you he's, he's not in the ground, he's in the Vatican. They, they, they claim that's where Peter's body is. I don't know if that's true or not. Uh, but anyway, Peter's not there, by the way. He's up in heaven. And then in verse um, 15, notice what it says there. After my decease... So he alludes to it. He knows he's getting close to death. And this is, this is common. I mean, we do this. I mean, when your grandfather was on his deathbed, he may have called the family around to, to tell them some things and to tell them he loved them. And, to, you know, it's, it, it's a common thing. We see it throughout the scriptures. In Genesis 49, Jacob called unto his sons. 
and said, Gather yourselves together that, it, that I may tell you that which shall befall you in the last days. When Joshua was about to die, in Joshua 24, uh, verses 14 and 15, this is a familiar passage, we're familiar with it, but the event that takes place right after this is Joshua's death. And he gathers the elders of Israel together, and that's where he, he tells them, he said, uh, serve the Lord in sincerity and in truth, and put away the gods of your fathers served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt, and serve ye the Lord. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, uh, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in which land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. David encouraged Solomon, his son, right before his death. He dies in the very next chapter. But when just before his death, he, he says to Solomon, be strong and of good courage and do it. Fear not, nor be dismayed. For the Lord God, even my God, will be with thee. He will not fail thee nor forsake thee until thou hast finished all the work for the service of the house of the Lord. What was he saying? Listen, I'm not going to be around. I've prepared a lot of things for this temple, but now it's your job, Solomon, to do it. That's God's will for your life. And he's reminding him of some things. And we need to be reminded of things. And we need to remind people of things. And God wants to remind us of things. Now, the question that I had as I studied this, what were the things that we needed to be reminded of? And, and perhaps you would see it if you read it through the whole chapter in one sitting. And I haven't been really reading the chapter that way. I've been just kind of looking at uh, little small sections at a time. And when you do that, sometimes you lose sight of the big picture. And so often when you're studying the Bible, you need to study words and phrases and verses and paragraphs, but every once in a while you need to step back and look at the big picture. And so in the big picture, the, 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 these things are the things, the seven things that he told us in verses five through seven that we needed to diligently add to our faith. If you notice verse eight, it says, if these things be in you and abound. What things? Well, verses 5 through 7. Besides this, giving all diligent, add to your faith virtue and virtue knowledge. And we spent seven weeks talking about those things. He says, if these things be in you and abound. In verse 9, for he that lacketh these things. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, in verse 10, for if you do these things. So we see this, this reference to these things three times previously. So the these things that he wants to remind us of in our text are the seven things. And again, so he's re-emphasizing. So he said in, in that series of messages that we studied in the first part of 2 Peter chapter 1, he said, giving all diligence. This is real important. Focus on this. Pay attention. This is something you really need to get right. Then he talked about how if you don't do these things, you're blind. He also talked about the fact that if you do these things, boy, you're going to have an abundant entrance, um, you're going to have security, and uh, you're going to be very fruitful in your service of the Lord. So he's encouraging them. And then he goes back to it again, and he said, listen, I need to remind you of these things that he just taught. And so he's really going overboard in emphasizing these truths. And by the way, it's not just those seven truths. He's we need to be reminded of all biblical truth all the time. And so Peter was concerned uh, about instilling these truths. He was concerned enough that he said he would continue to remind them of these things as long as he was with them. And so you can imagine Peter every time he gathers together saying, now listen, don't forget about this. Did you ever have your parents say that to you? Hey, don't forget. Don't forget. And what do we always do? We always forget. And Peter's like that parent that's saying, listen, don't forget about these things. And by the way, that's why he penned these words. Look at verse 15. He said, I will endeavor that you may be able after my decease to have these things always in remembrance. Well, they weren't going to have him always, but he wrote these things down. And by the way, the Holy Spirit intended that we all as Christians have these things as well. Because he included that letter that Peter wrote to this group of believers in Asia Minor. He said, I want that letter to be included in the canon of Scripture. And that's part of the canon of Scripture. So God wants all of us to remember these things. Notice a couple of other things I want to point out before we move on to the next section. Notice in verse 14, 
The Bible says this, knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle. Notice this phrase, even as our Lord Jesus Christ hath showed me. So where did the Lord Jesus Christ show him? Well, if you go back to John chapter 21, and you don't have to, they'll put the verses up on the screen for you. Jesus told Peter about his death. And so we have it recorded here in John chapter 21. And this is when, remember when Peter went fishing because he was so discouraged because he denied the Lord. And then the Lord is there and he's on the shore and he's got the great, uh, he's got a bunch of fish already cooking there. And he calls the disciples over. Uh, Children, have you any meat? That whole passage of scripture there. And he says to Peter, Peter, lovest thou me more than these? And Peter replies with, yeah, I love you, Lord. I'm fond of you. And it wasn't the same word that Peter used. Peter used the word agape, or Jesus used the word agape. Do you, will you die for me, Peter? Peter said, I'm fond of you. And why? Because Peter was discouraged because he had already promised the Lord he would die for him. And he blew it. He didn't die for him. He denied him. And so he thought the Lord wouldn't want to have anything to do with him. So now the Lord's bringing him back. The gifts and calling of God are without repentance. And he's bringing him back saying, Peter, I'm not done with you yet. You, in fact, are going to die for me. And uh, it says in, in chapter 21 of John, verse 18, Jesus speaking, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, when you were young, you girded yourself and walked where you would. But when you'll, you'll be old, you'll stretch forth your hands and another will gird you, bind you, clothe you, whatever, and carry you where you don't want to go. This spake he, Jesus spoke this, signifying by what death he, Peter, should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said unto him, follow me. So Peter, I'm, I'm not done with you. Follow me. Which is exactly what he said to him back at the beginning of his ministry. And so Peter um, knew this. He, he was, the Lord showed it to him. He knew he was going to die. Of course, tradition tells us that Peter was crucified upside down. His wife also was crucified. And uh, notice something else in this passage of Scripture. In verse 13, it says he wanted to stir them up by reminding them. Being reminded of things sometimes will stir us up. Um, in 2 Peter chapter 3, and verse 1, he says something very similar. He said, this second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. Uh, Paul talks a lot about stirring up. In 2 Timothy, he wrote... Uh, to Timothy, and he said, when I call to remembrance, so he's remembering something, the unfeigned faith, the real, unfeigned meaning real faith, genuine faith that is in you, uh, Timothy, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, Eunice, actually it's pronounced, and I am persuaded that in thee also, wherefore I put thee in remembrance, that thou, notice this, stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. We need to be stirred up. That's why we have revival meetings. That's why we have these special prayer meetings. Brother Bob, God, put it on Brother Bob Fenton's heart. Let's have a prayer meeting. And we've done it in the past where we had these cottage prayer meetings. And we go through these periods where, and, I, and I've learned we really can't manufacture these things. It's something that God really has to kind of lay upon us. And we go through periods where, you know, we encourage each other and we go through a little bit of a spiritual awakening, a renewal, if you will, a reminder of something we once knew, but we need to be stirred up about and reminded about. And so, um, and this is what Peter is telling them. You need to be reminded. So these are the final uh, remembrances, if you will. But then secondly, look at verse 16. This is Peter's famous remembrance of Christ's glory. He talks about the fact that, listen, I saw something that revealed Christ's glory so I'm not just telling you something somebody told me, and maybe it's true, maybe it's not true. It's not some fable. It's the real deal. He said, for we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known of, unto you the power, notice that, the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Keep in mind the overall theme is going to be not only persecution, but the second coming of Christ. But were eyewitnesses of his majesty, now, if you just had verse 16, you might wonder what he's talking about, but verse 17, open it up so we can't really miss what he's talking about. For he received from God, the Father, honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. 
And this voice which came down, uh, came from heaven, we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. Now take your Bibles and turn to Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9. It's the only other verse of scripture I'll ask you to turn to. It's a longer passage, so I didn't quote it in my notes. Mark chapter 9. He's talking about the Mount of Transfiguration. Peter, James, and John went up with the Lord on the mountain, and the Lord was transfigured before him. Peter got a glimpse of the Lord in his glory. See, when you picture the Lord, you picture this long hair guy wearing a robe, walking around the wilderness of Judea and going into the temple and preaching and teaching and breaking bread and doing all these things. But the, the Lord in his glory does not look anything like that. The way the Lord Jesus Christ looks today is nothing like that. And Peter got a glimpse of it on the Mount of Transfiguration. Look at chapter 9 and verse 1. He said unto them, verily, this is Jesus speaking, by the way. Notice this, there be some of you that stand here. Peter, James, and John were those ones which shall not taste of death. You're not going to die till they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. Now, these three didn't see the kingdom of God. They didn't see Christ coming back in the second coming, and Christ setting up the second kingdom, sitting on a throne in Jerusalem. They didn't see that, but they saw a picture of it, an image of it, a glimpse of it when the Lord was transfigured on the mountain. Look at verse 2. And after six days, Jesus taketh with him Peter and James and John, leadeth them up into an high mountain apart by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. Notice this, and his raiment became shining, exceeding white as snow, so as no fuller on earth can wipe them. Notice this, this is really crazy, and there appeared unto them, so you got the Lord, Peter, James, and John, the Lord is transfigured, he's glowing, and then all of a sudden, and there appeared unto them Elias, or Elijah, with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. Now, Peter does something dumb. He does this often. Uh, I do it myself. He says something before he thinks about it. Peter answered and said, Jesus, Master, it's good for us to be here. Let's make three tabernacles. Uh, Acts chapter 1, he said, let's pick a replacement for Judas. Uh, you know, he just says, hey, we need to do something. Sometimes we need to wait. Jesus said in the book of Acts, tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power. I'll, I'll tell you what I want you to do. And sometimes we don't wait to do or say what God wants us to do or say. We jump in. I do it myself. I'm very impulsive. But he said, uh, it's good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, tents, booths. One for you, Lord. One for Moses and one for Elias. Now, what was he doing? He was, he was kind of putting the Lord Jesus on the same plane as Moses and Elijah. He was saying, boy, Moses is a great leader. Man, he gave us the law. Elijah, he was that mighty prophet. And now we have you, Lord, and we're going to make three booths. One for you and one for these two guys. And notice, for he wist not what to say. He didn't know what to say. I, I told the church earlier, when you don't know what to say, here's some advice for all of us. Don't say anything. Say what you know is right to say. Don't let any corrupt communication proceed forth out of your mouth, but that which is good for the use of edifying that it may minister grace to the hearers. Other than that, shut your mouth. He didn't know what to say, so he said it, and boy, he didn't get rebuked by Moses. He didn't get rebuked by Elijah. He didn't even get rebuked by Jesus. He got rebuked from the Father in heaven, and there was a cloud that overshadowed them and a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son. Hear ye him. Listen to him. Forget about these other two guys. They're great people, but they're just men. Uh, by the way, any, any man is just a man. They're not God. And um, we need to be reminded of that often. So this transfiguration in Mark, it's also in Matthew 17 and Luke chapter 9, the three synoptic gospels. It's a picture of the glorified Lord. It's what the Lord will look like when you see him someday. By the way, Revelation chapter 1 also gives us another glimpse of that. If you want to look there, Revelation chapter 1, beginning in verse 10. John the Apostle, who was also there on the transfiguration, Mount of Transfiguration when the Lord was still on the earth, after the Lord ascended and, you know, John's very old and he would, they tried to boil him in oil 
and he survived it. He's banished by Domitian to the Isle of Patmos. He's given the revelation. God appears to him again. And here's the passage. It says in verse 10, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day, Sunday. It's good to be uh, in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. And heard behind me a great voice, as of a trumpet, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, unto Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and this is the Lord. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow. Notice this, his eyes were as a flame of fire. His feet like undefined brass, as if they burned in a furnace. And his voice, notice this, as the sound of many waters. And that's not a babbling brook or, or your water faucet trickling down. That's the sound of Niagara Falls. You were just at Niagara Falls. You heard it. It's deafening if you get up close to it. That's what his voice sounded like. And notice this, and he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and notice this, his countenance, this is this shining, this is what, by the way, Moses saw when he was up on the mount, he saw this shining, and matter of fact, he glowed when he came down, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength, and when I saw him, and this is what we'll do as well, I fell at his feet as dead. I once had a guy say to me one time when I said, what would you do if you saw the Lord? You know, he was, he was a mocker, you know, a scoffer, as Peter would call them. What would you do if you saw the Lord face to face? He said, I'd spit right in his face. And I thought about that, and I thought to myself, I said, that, that saliva wouldn't even begin to get gathered together in your mouth before the Lord would take his little pinky out and nuke you, and you'd be done. You, everybody who has ever seen the Lord, they all do the same thing. They hit the ground. They lay prostrate on their face before God. He fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand. Jesus laid his right hand upon him, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, crucified. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of hell and death. And so... Peter's emphasis, he's talking about the second coming. We're going to behold the Lord in all of his glory. He mentioned it in his first letter. In chapter 1 and verse 13 of 1 Peter, he said, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end, for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And then in chapter 4, in verse 12 and 13, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you, but rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when His glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. And by the way, chapter 3 of 2 Peter, that whole chapter is all about the second coming of the Lord. And in uh, verses 3 and 4, he said, know this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers. You ever meet a scoffer? I met lots of them, scoffers. Ah, you, you, you Christians, you've been talking about Christ coming back forever. When's he going to come back? Notice this, they walk after their own lust and they say, where's the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, everything's the same as it used to be at the beginning of creation. Nothing's changed. Well, that's not true. A lot of things have changed. There was a little thing called the flood since creation. That was a big change. And the Lord is coming back. And the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, we're not willing that any should perish. And if God delays his coming at all, it's because there's somebody out there that will be saved. And he wants to get the gospel to that person. Uh, uh, Paul, in the book of Romans, talked about blindness in part hath come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. And when that last Gentile gets saved, there's going to be a trumpet sound and there's going to be a shout with the voice of the archangel and Christ is going to meet us in the air and we're going to be gathered together up with him and we'll be taken up into heaven. There's going to be a seven-year tribulation period and at the end of that, there's going to be that battle of Armageddon where all the lost will be gathered together in the valley of Megiddo and Christ is going to come down and with that same sword, two-edged sword, which proceeds forth out of his mouth, he's going to wipe out all those that opposed him. 
And every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's going to happen. Mark it down. Don't be a scoffer. The Bible teaches it. We're going to get to talking about the Bible in just a second. So Peter taught them about this. Now notice verses 19 through 21. And we're going to develop this further tonight. So if you want to get the full dose of this, you got to come back tonight. Okay? So we're going to talk... the title of tonight's message is what we believe about the Bible because these three verses talk about inspiration and how God gave us the scriptures look at verses 19 through 21 we have a more we have also a more sure word of prophecy whereunto ye do well that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. It's a very important passage of scripture. It teaches us some things about the Bible. This verse helps us really to understand the doctrine of inspiration. Theopneustos means God breathed, or it actually means God's spirit, God's spirit. This is not like every other book. This is not just a book that's 100% accurate. This is a book that's got the breath of God, the life of God, the spirit of God on it. The Bible says all scripture is given by inspiration of God. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews, for the word of God is quick. That word quick, it means alive. It's living. This book is not like another book. Some people say, well, you know, that King James Bible, it's, it's not inspired. And uh, I get what they're trying to say. But you got to be careful when you say that because what you're saying is this book's not alive when you say that. They say it's only preserved. I love what Dr. Gray used to say. King Tut is preserved, but he's not alive. He's dead. He's preserved. The Word of God is not only the inspiration that was on the originals is preserved in this translation. So we can say when we open this book, thus saith the Lord. We can say that with confidence. And um, Peter is reassuring them of the word of God. And there's a lot of things we need to talk about regarding inspiration. There's this thing called confluent inspiration. It means that the scriptures are a product of a dual agency. The Holy Spirit and a human author, a human writer, I should say. The author is the Holy Spirit, the writer is the individual writers. And what that means is this, is that the personalities of the individual writers can be seen in the writings. So when you see Paul's writings, you kind of, you can know it's from Paul. And I've really come to realize this just recently. I just got done translating 1 John. And 1 John's got a flow and style to it, certain words that are used often. But now I'm translating Philippians chapter 2. And I'm not trying to correct this Bible. This Bible's perfect. I'm just trying to understand it a little more and study each word individually. And I'm translating Philippians chapter 2, and I discovered that Philippians chapter 2 is nothing like 1 John. The whole way it's written is cataclysmically different. So John had a unique writing style. He used unique vocabulary. He, He used a lot of verbs. Paul uses a lot of participles which are what? Verbal nouns or something. I don't really understand them all, but they're, he uses them. And uh, they work differently than nouns. And so it's different. The human writer's personality style flows through it, yet it's still all God's word. God superintended. His breath is on all of it. He worked within the individual writers uniquely and produced a divine book. But then there's something called verbal inspiration, meaning that the very words of Scripture are God's words. And it's words, by the way. It's not just word. It's not just a thought. It's not just the thoughts that are inspired. It's every individual word. By the way, every individual jot and tittle in the Scripture are important. And, um, And so, you know, the Bible says, Heaven and earth shall not pass away, but my words, plural, shall not pass away. And then there's something called plenary or plenary inspiration. It means that Bible is inspired throughout. All of the Bible is inspired equally in every part. 
There's not one portion of scripture more important than another. You know, red letter Bibles. How many of you got a red letter Bible? Anybody have a red letter Bible? You know what I mean by red letter? You got a red letter Bible. You got a red letter Bible. And I've had tons of red letter Bibles. I don't know if this is a red letter Bible or not. To be honest with you, it's not. But I've had tons of them. Some people say that the red letter Bible, red letters, well, that's really important because that's what Jesus said. No, all of it is what Jesus said. It's all the word of God. Um, and so now we do, it's, it's helpful to know when Jesus is actually speaking and when somebody else is speaking. But verbal inspiration, plenary inf inspiration, inerrant inspiration means the Bible was written down correctly in every detail. Uh, God cannot lie and neither can his word be incorrect. And uh, then there's infallible inspiration. That's slightly different from inerrant. We use those words sometimes interchangeably. But uh, inerrancy has more to do with the correctness of the recording. Infallibility has more to do with the fact that the teaching that he's teaching, in other words, inerrancy it means that every jot, every tittle, every word is exactly where it's supposed to be. Infallibility has to do with the authority of what's being taught. It's all accurate. It's all authoritative. Now, of course, without the illumination, there's another word we'll talk about tonight, of the Holy Spirit, the inspired word will have little impact on man. God has to divinely work in the hearts of his people to understand the word of God. He illuminates the scriptures to us. The natural man or the unsaved man doesn't understand the scriptures because the Bible says the scriptures are spiritually discerned. And if a person doesn't have the indwelling Holy Spirit of God to help him understand, he cannot understand the Bible. However, the Holy Spirit will illuminate. He'll, he'll open up his word to a lost person at times so that person can understand. Oftentimes, it's also with the help or guidance of a believer in order for that person to be saved. But to understand the deep truths of the Bible, you have to be saved. And the Holy Spirit has to teach you. And by the way, the Holy Spirit won't necessarily teach even a saved person everything. You don't need it now. He teaches you what you need for what you're going through right now. He'll teach you more as you grow. But the bottom line, the conclusion to this is, is all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. And so we have the Word of God. Peter's reminding of this. We have a Forget about something I told you when I was with you. We have a more sure word of prophecy. We have the Bible. And we need to believe that it is, in fact, God's word. And it contains God's plan for us. We need to be reminded continuously of the word of God. And we need to let the word of God stir us to do the will of God. Why? Well, go back to the overall theme of this letter. Christ is coming back. You're running out of time. I'm running out of time. There's gonna, you're going to turn around twice. That rapture is going to happen. And everything that we were commanded to do on this earth, there's going to be no time left to do it. We better get busy. That's why I'm really convicted about outreach, trying to get the gospel out, and this blitz we're doing in March. Uh, I want to get back out there doing what God has called us as a church to do, uh, even more so as we see the day approaching. And we do see the day approaching. Christ is coming back. We need to be stirred and reminded of these truths in the Word of God. And now again, tonight we're going to talk more about this stuff. Tonight I'm going to talk about revelation, inspiration, uh, illumination, canonization. What are the other ization words? I'm, I'm missing one of them. Revelation, inspiration, illumination, canonization, preservation. That's the other one. We're going to talk about that as well. And, uh, if we, and, and here's what's going to be great about it. If we don't get done, I'll just stop at a certain time because uh, I'll just go through it again next week. If we have to make it a mini-series for two weeks, we'll do that. But that'll be tonight. What do we believe about the Bible? And it's really what I believe about the Bible. It's uh, most of the information, it comes from this paper that I had to write uh, that was like a 100-page paper I had to write for my doctrinal thesis. And, um, and so, you know, I take all the Bible doctrines, but I, I, I wrote extensively on bibliology, which is the science, the understanding, the teaching of the Bible. And so we're going to spend some time trying to understand that. You may have a different position, and we'll, but you'll hear mine. Anyway, so uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. 
Father, I thank you, God, for just the opportunity to be in your house today. I pray, God, you'd work in our hearts. I pray that you would stir us, Lord. We need to be stirred. We're dead as doornails most of the time spiritually. And not that we're completely dead. I mean, there's life in us. The Holy Spirit is within us. But we need to be stirred. We need you to stir us. We need to remind ourselves of the things that stir us, the principles that stirred us, you know, last year or two years ago from the scriptures. God, help us with those things. God, I pray you'd work in our hearts, work in our lives. Help us to be, God, stirred up and reminded of these important principles. Help us to grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's all stand to our feet. If God spoke to your heart and you need to come and pray, the altar's open. You can pray at your seat if you like. Something about humbling yourself at an old-fashioned altar. One of the things I liked about going to that uh, port church is they got an old-fashioned mourner's bench kind of an altar there. Back in the old days when people wanted to do business with God, they, they went down to the mourner's bench. And there was just something that's sweet about doing that. And if our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed, if that's you, you'd like to come and pray. Maybe you've been a little dead in your faith, and I would have to confess that happens to me a lot. Maybe you need to ask God to help you with it. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed, nobody's looking around. Maybe you're, you're here today and you've never trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. Maybe you're here in the auditorium or perhaps you're watching online. You've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior. That's the, the first step in all of this. Remember, Peter was writing to those that were of like precious faith. And he said, we have to add these things to our faith. So we have to begin with faith. Do you have faith? And that's talking about saving faith. That's not just believing that something happened or believing that somebody existed, that's placing a saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, depending on Him, trusting Him and Him alone to save you. Have you placed your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you know for sure that you're going to heaven when you die? If you don't, well, I, I'd love to have the opportunity to help you with it. And if you're here in the auditorium, I, I can take the Bible and I can show you how you can know for sure that you can go to heaven when you die. Jesus Christ bled and died on the cross for your sins. And the Bible says all you need to be willing to do is confess that you're a sinner, believe that you deserve judgment, but also believe that Jesus Christ died for you and depend on him and him alone. Turn from your sin and turn to the Savior. The Bible says whoever comes to him, he will in no wise cast out. Whosoever will may come and drink of the waters of life freely. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. God's willing to save you, but are you willing to call upon him? If you haven't done that, you need to, and I'd love to help you through it. If you're watching online, by the way, there's a button on our website that says, Why Jesus? If you have questions about salvation, you get a lot of answers there. And if you communicate with us through that My Response button, uh, we'll, we'll communicate back with you, and we'll help you. As, we'll give you as much help as you want from the Scriptures regarding salvation or any other Bible question you might have. Salvation is the key, but listen, once you're saved, are you diligently adding these things to your faith? You need to, so do I. Amen. And we're going to close our service out with our chorus. We'll run the race. We'll run the race. We will press on. Keep up the pace. Don't quit today. Encourage those along the way, continue on in Jesus' name. Our strength to run is in Christ alone, we'll fix our eyes on Jesus' face, the one who saved us by his grace. You are dismissed.